six. And then also we're going to be talking about Colossians chapter three. If you want to put a title on this, I want you to title it, Quit Crimping the Flow. You know, I, of course, all, all of us have done this, but um, I was watching Yvonne this week. And <laughs> <laughs> I was watching Yvonne this week watering some of her flowers and and need, needing a hose for something else. And it, watch this. There was, from the spigot throughout the hose, there was a constant flow. Until she did what most of us have done. She grabbed the hose, and she crimped it. Okay? Now, crimping that hose, sometimes, if you're strong enough, you can shut off the flow. Or you have the ability to open your hand up a little bit and allow some trickles to come out. So actually, the crimping of the hose is a way of control. You're going to get this this morning. So the question is, you know, what, where in life, in the things of God, is God wanting there to be a constant flow, but yet we have chosen to crimp the hose? Because I, because I really, I really want to control the flow of God. There is never, ever, 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 ever too much power from God. Amen. There's never, ever too much power from God, and we should want to be a conduit that's that's living in a constant flow of God. But unfortunately, that's not what happens in the body of Christ. We love Jesus, you know, you know, but I don't know, you know, and, and we're constantly using our spiritual hands to crimp the hose, and we, you know, we want to trickle it out, and now we, we want some more. I'll tell you, God is never pleased. Everybody look at me. God is never pleased when we are trying to slow down the power of God. God's never pleased with that. I don't care what side of the tracks you come from. I don't care what you think. God is never pleased with that. So the truth is, we've got to get self out of the way. So then the question is, is it possible for the power of God to be hindered? And of course there is. Jesus said in Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, This happened, this happened in the ministry of Jesus. Now, he could do no mighty works there except that he laid his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled at their unbelief. So unbelief can interfere with the flow of God. It does not change God, but it changes us. Religious people are forever keeping their hands on the hose. I don't know if I agree with all this speaking in tongues business. You ain't read, you ain't read your Bible. I'll go as far as to tell you, and I'll, and I'll watch this, and I'll back it up. The only church that God ever raised up was a spirit-filled church. And I'm not talking about tongues, but I'm talking about a church that's willing to uh, understand the gifts of the Spirit. A church that people are saying, you know, I really want to, I really want to be able to hear the voice of God. I, I really want to uh, know how to function and how to operate. I haven't, listen, I haven't always been here before, but this is definitely over the past few years, God, God has been doing this with me, and I, and I appreciate it. So therefore, I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep the hose clear of obstacles. I prayed for someone the other day, you know, and, and, I, and I reached over and I put my hand on a certain spot. That was it. I just did what I did, and I walked away. It's no big deal. And since then, someone said, but how did you know right there? 
Well, it's not that I knew. It's not that, it's not that I'm not a psychic. It's just when you walk in the Spirit, you hear the voice of God, and you just, you just do it. Yesterday, Dane was at the, uh, at the party, and, and he was having a bad back, and I was standing next to him, and Carol, and Carol said uh, uh, that, that uh, Dane's back was bothering him. He said, Pastor, can, can we pray? And we prayed, you know, and the very next word that came out of his mouth, as you prayed, I could just feel some real warm stuff happening right here. It's not, it's, it's not that, that I have the ability to do that. Everybody look at me. But when we learn to tap into things of God, God is not interested in who you are and what you can do. God wants his presence to flow through you. This isn't, this, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't for just pastors and teachers and evangelists. This is a gift that's been given to the body of Christ. Okay? And let me, let me even say this. The stuff I'm talking about, it is not your gift. I hear a lot of people saying, well, my gifting is this. My, no, no. It is, it is always the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Don't take ownership what doesn't belong to you because then you're stealing from God. It is, it is not my gift. God uses me in a lot of gifts, but it is not my gift. It, it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went around everywhere demonstrating the power of God. He started healing the sick, casting out devils, performing uh, many miracles. Now, let's, let's go back. This Jesus I'm talking about at this point in time, we're not talking about just the Son of God. We're talking about an ordinary man. Now, as Jesus walking down the road, how did he know? See, when people were trying to find Jesus, all these trees, the sycamore trees that were there, there were tons of people in the trees. Not with just one, but he stops and he speaks directly to Zacchaeus. And he says, Zacchaeus, get out of that tree because I'm headed to your house. How did, how did he know? Because he, he was tapped into the heart of the Father. How did Jesus meet the woman at the well and begin to just to talk about the, the, her issues and her problems and, and brought to her mind, you know, uh, why don't you, and I, I, I love Jesus. He says, go home and tell your husband, because he knew that she was going to say, I don't have a husband. He said, you said that very well. Not only don't you, you don't have a husband, but you've had five, and none of them belong to you. Wow, all of a sudden lights came on. How did, how did this man, Jesus, know this stuff? Because he referred to crimp the hose. He refused to shut off the flow of God. Interesting. <laughs> In his own hometown, Nazareth, the flow of God was often hindered. He could do no mighty works there. He could do no mighty works there in his own town. I, 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 I guess that's what God does for humans to keep us humble. Because I can, and I say this, please, and this isn't brag, but I can go around the world. As a matter of fact, last time I was in Africa, the, there was a flyer, you know, the bishop from America is coming. I'm telling you, thousands of people showed up. Wow. I told you before, I preached in a room probably about twice this size, and this side here had nothing but windows, and the entire place was full, and people were on the outside the windows. I mean, they're all, oh, they're all just pushed in together, you know, because they wanted to hear the gospel. They wanted to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I gave an altar call, and I really wish I would have had my, my camera with me because these people from the outside literally start spilling into the room. They wanted to get in, so they were crawling over and falling on the floor just, just, just to come down to be prayed for because they wanted to be in the presence of God. Not, 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 not in just Africa. It happened in, it happened in Madagascar. You know, it's, it's, happening, it's happening around the nations. Here's what I'm finding out about else, people elsewhere. They are truly hungry. For God. Most Americans, they're not hungry for God. They'll fit God in if they have a free day. 
I was talking with him, and I'm sure he's watching. I was talking with my pastor in, in um, uh, Pakistan the other day. It was 119 degrees. These plastic cars were melting, literally. She, uh, they sent me pictures. The bumpers were melting off. The traffic lights, they were melting. It was that hot. But you know what these Christians in an Islamic country were doing? They were leaving their houses to go sit out in the blazing sun on the roof because they wanted to hear the gospel. Yeah. They just don't want to crimp. They don't want to crimp the flow. The flow of God. Let me show you something about about the Christian walk. And you can write this down because I'm, I, ultimately I'm going to give you 12 reasons, 12 ways to live in an uncrimped life. See, our problem is the fact that we have a divided and a fragmented heart. We got we got the we have a heart for God, but we have a heart for ourselves. If it doesn't fit into my agenda, then I'm not sure if I want to do that or not. I'm 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 from the old school, and I would be I'll love it when we get back to the place. But you know, I cut my teeth on Sunday evening church services. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I, I told you, I, yeah, I was a preacher's kid, whether that's, whether that's good or bad, but I was. Uh, but you know, we did the Sunday school thing in the morning, and then we had church, and, 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 and the black church, when people churched, they churched. They, they churched. I mean, we used to have those, uh, those um, funeral fans. Remember those? It, it made a, a little w wooden stick with the fans on it, you know. Normally it came from 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 a funeral home, you know, and everybody was just fanning themselves. Yeah, matter of fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell on my wife here. <laughs> I know Sarah knew I was gonna go there. Uh, we were we were in. Uh, <laughs> she said I'm so mean. Uh, a few years ago, we were we uh, we were in uh, Oroville, California, and uh, I was preaching there. I was preaching there that night, and it was it was real hot. If they didn't have air conditioning, the thing was real muggy and, you know. That's right. That's right. It was an old funeral home, you know. And uh, so so we were there. I don't know. Yeah. So we were there, you know, and uh, it was hot, you know. And <laughs> Dorothy and the kids were there. And Dorothy just got so relaxed that she just kind of leaned back in her chair a little bit. Yeah, she was only, and she had this, she had this fan, <laughs> she had this fan just going, you know, and to the. See, some, see, unfortunately, some, some of you don't know Dorothy's mom, Martha, but I'll tell you what. If something hits, hits her funny in church, oh, man, it's, it's, it's over. Anyway, God wants us to learn how to live an uncrimped life. Man, I, I told you that we have a divided heart. We have, we, we've got this and we've got this. And, it, and it need, it needs to, it, our life needs to be centered around the things of God. Everybody look at me. If you, if you center your life around the things of God, people will not hurt your feelings. If, 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 if this is my place of safety right here and nothing can really get to me here, I'm good. But if I go here, I've just opened up my heart, my life, everything. So all, all this stuff is, no, I've, I've, I need to learn how to come and stay right here. Are you following me? Yeah. God is bringing us to a place of, of, of change. So it's really, we, we talk, and we're going to talk here in a few moments about our, our old nature and our new nature. But unfortunately, we are still closer to our old nature 
then we are a new nature. So therefore, we make an excuse. We say, well, Pastor, you need to understand that I'm just human. You are not just human. You used to be just human. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says that your father was the devil. That's who you used to be. But now you've come into a new place. Now your father is almighty God. Glory to God. And now, now we work on taking on the new nature. And sometimes we need to stand back and be honest with ourselves. We don't need anyone else to do this for us. We need to stand back and be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves the question. Is what I'm feeling and how I'm reacting, is this of God or not? Someone say amen or oh me. <laughs> changes, changes evidence that something is happening in us or to us. And we can change for the good or for the bad. And the choice is ours. Because nobody stays neutral. If we're not changing, then we become mediocre. Interesting about change. The only thing that doesn't change is that which is artificial or dead. This has been sitting here for years. This is exactly how it was five years ago. Because it's not alive. It's dead. And what has happened in the church, the body of Christ, not here, but universal. We've got people that love God. I'm not, I'm not saying they don't love God. But as far as change is concerned, they have refused to let God move them into another level. Therefore, they have settled for mediocrity. And mediocrity needs to be your worst enemy. So how do we change things? Let me give you four things, and then we're going to take you to Colossians, show you some things in Colossians. Number one, we need to stand back and take a look at ourselves objectively. In other words, you need, you need, I tell you what, I want you to take a spiritual selfie. I want you to take a spiritual selfie. Is, is that really who you want to look like? Is that really who you want to be? I have to, I have to do that for myself. Is the way I look, the way I carry myself, is this, is, is this really the picture that I want to show Christ and is this the picture I want to show the world? We need to make our mind up that we're going to be honest with ourselves. I have asked myself, is Christ satisfied with my walk. The conversation that we carried on, is God satisfied with listening to the conversation that I carried on? We got a lot of people in, in, in the Bible, you love God, but they're the biggest gossipers in the world. They, they, they want to find the next scuttlebutt. Matter of fact, some of the stuff that you're asking is none of your business. They're going through those issues. Matter of fact, let me, uh, yeah, you, you, I'm just a straight shooter here. Let me, let me help some adults here. You got questions asked. You don't go to kids and ask questions about their families. That's diabolical. You, tell you if you want to know something about me, don't ask my grandkids. You come and ask me. How we doing? Hey, I'm I <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I'm just a straight shooter. Hey, tell you what, when I love God and I'm here, I don't get entangled in all that other stuff. I just I just I just can't. My my life is so full of doing what God wants, I don't have time for all the other stuff. I told you two things I want. I want to pray and play.
is this, uh, I'm still doing four things here, but is, is this the way you desire for people to see you? What do people say about you when you're not around? And I know the response to that because I've said it before. I really don't care. I got this. But I'm going to tell you something. I finally get to the place. I want to live my life to a point that what they say around me, that man's honorable. Sometimes he's kind of harsh when he preaches. I got this. And sometimes he gets under my skin. That's okay. But he's honorable. One thing I know, that Bishop Gabe is a man of his word. That's important to me because I need to be a representation of Christ. Come on, someone say amen to that. That's, that's how we need to live our life. Thirdly, is this the way you, you want your children or your grandchildren to live their lives? Hello? Hello? I need, to, I need to stand back with my 20 grandkids. I need to live my life to the point. I, I don't care really, really what their parents do. You know, their, their parents might be doing something else, but as far as Papa is concerned, do I want to live my life that, to the point that they say, you know, one thing I know about my Papa, he's honorable, and I want to be like my Papa. That's important to me. So I want to live my life above reproach is work sometimes it's hard number four I want you to visualize yourself living in greatness John chapter 10 verse 10 I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly God we need to visualize, visualize our life living in greatness wow So Paul, he's writing to the church of Colossae. Colossae had been under attack from false teachers. They were, dis they were uh, degenerating the deity of Christ. They were teaching that Christ was not actually God. So through Paul, he wanted to address these issues head on. He wanted to let them know the nature of Jesus Christ as the creator and the redeemer and all that was non-negotiable. Paul wrote to them that he might bring wisdom to bear on difficult trying situations. You can find all this in Colossians chapter 1 verse 25 and also chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. Now let's talk about Colossae. Colossae was a, was a coastal city. Matter of fact, people came from thousands of miles around to do their laundry in Colossae. They would go there with dirty clothes. They would literally unrobe by the lake. They would take off their old clothes, they would bathe, and then they would put on new clothes. This is why Paul, in, in this passage, he's always talking about taking off the old man and putting on the new man. So somehow we need to stand back and we need to be honest with ourselves and we need to say, that is, that is the old nature. That is not my new nature. My new nature doesn't look like that. It doesn't smell like that. That new nature is renewed in God constantly. Colossians. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, and I think uh, Pastor Chase will put that up on the board for you. If ye thee be being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Okay, now, the right hand of God is the place of authority. Those are in authority is set at the right hand. No wonder God says that we sit in heavenly places with him and God has set us at his right hand. So there we, therefore, you are people, men and women, with authority. 
Unfortunately, some of, we, we, we read that in the book, but we don't know how to function in authority. Okay? The Bible doesn't tell us to go someplace and ask for authority. You take authority. Amen. I want to go into a room by the power of God, and I want to walk into that room and, and take authority over vi every vile, evil spirit. Yeah. I want to get to the place that when I walk up, the devil gets uneasy. Amen. I want to live my life in the point that, that when, when I wake up in the morning, the devil goes, oh, no, he's awake. <laughs> Because you are people of authority. God says, I've given you keys to the kingdom. And whatever you loose, God says, I'll loose. And whatever you bind, I will bind. So then we need to understand the importance of binding and loosing. You know, you know I, I hear a whole lot of people saying, well, I, I just bind that in Jesus' name. You don't bind nothing until you're ready to release something else. Authority. Let's, let's, let's read on, then we'll get back to these things. Uh, verse 2. Set your affection on those things which are, abo uh, are above and not on things of the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore the members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, ignorance, affection, uh, evil concupiscence, covetousness, and which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. Verse 7. In, uh, in which uh, ye also have walked uh, sometimes, which you lived in them. But now ye also put off these things. Now watch this. Put off anger. Put off wrath. Put off malice. Put off blasphemy. Put off, put off evil communication that comes out of your mouth. Oh my goodness. Do not lie to one another, but to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither uh, Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, uh, bond or free, but Christ, who is all in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and believe bowels of of mercies and kindness and, hum and, and humbleness of mind and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving 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 one another. Hello? Uh, we got to get this? Yeah, because if you don't forgive me, then, you, then God can't forgive you. Glory to God. We don't like to hear this, but let's, 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 let's read the whole thing here. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave uh, you, also, uh, so also do ye. Above all things, uh, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God be in your hearts, that which... Uh, also, ye are called into one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and, and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart uh, to the Lord. And whatever you do uh, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God and to the Father by him. I'm going to give you 12 qu quick ways to uncrimp the hose. Because you have you have a flow that's happening through you. God never shuts the flow off. We're the ones that shuts the flow off. My everybody look at me. My flesh 
gets in the way of the flow of God. All my preconceived notions, ideas, and how I feel and what I think, and you know, all, all that gets in the way of the flow of God. I do not, for my, myself, I don't want to crimp the hose. Matter of fact, I want more power flowing through my life. Glory to God. I, want, I, I, I guess I want God to, to, to turn me into not just being a garden hose. I want God to turn me into a fire hose. Hello? Yeah. I want to see a supernatural flow of the Spirit of God. Now, how do we do this? You're going to find this in verse number one. Seek things that are above. The Bible says, let's find out what God's talking about. Seek things that are above. Yeah, I, I, I watch what the world's not doing. I watch what other pastors aren't doing. And, and if I'm not careful, I let that get in my spirit. Hello? I don't want that to happen. I'm not in charge of them. I'm only in charge of this. I'm not in charge of you. I'm only in charge of this. I've got to make my own decisions. You've got to make yours. So what, so what do I do? According to Scripture, I need to learn to start seeking those things which are above. The word seek is a very important word. Seek, is, seek isn't just uh, maybe I, I may stumble across something. Seek is, says, I am going to do this until I find it. I will, I will turn up. I will, I, I will turn up cushions. I'll move couches. I'll, I, I, I am, I'm going to be relentless in my search. Your flow of God is not going to find be found in your past religious experience. I don't knock my past religious experience, and I thank God what I got. But I'll tell you what: what happened in my life as a kid, even in church, is not s substantial enough to help me now. I need to have a fresh, up-to-date experience with God today. Amen. Amen. I, yesterday is gone. One man said, "Life is like money. Yesterday's a canceled check. Tomorrow's a promissory note. All we have is today, so spend it wisely." This is all I got. So the Bible says in that verse 1, seek the things which are above. Number 2, he says, set your affections on those things which are, which are above. In other words, fall in love with what God loves. Become very affectionate to the Word. Be, become very affectionate to people that don't even like you. Become very affectionate to, to those that, that have rubbed you the wrong way. Don't, don't let them pull you into their ground game. I like watching wrestling and UFC, you know, I do. And I was watching wa watch a previous fighter, and he's a master at the ground game. All takes all of his opponents, and he pulls them into the ground game because he knows he could win on the ground. You've heard me preach on this before. Satan is a master at the ground game. If I can get them upset and make them lose their cool, I can bring them to the ground. But the real masters, they know it's a stand-up fight. Yeah. I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to understand the bobbing and the weaving. You know, I, I, you know uh, this is the stand-up fight. If we say to our opponent, no, I'm not going to give you the power to bring, you, bring me into your ground game. Somebody needs to get this, please. Set your affection on things which are above. Do not let people pull you into their ground game. Because the very moment you do that, you've just given up a whole lot. Matter of fact, one, one of the worst positions to be in in, in, in in wrestling is turn over and let your opponent get your back. Horrible position to be in. On your back, you'll get, you'll get choked out. God never intended us to get on our backs. Matter of fact, the word cast, C-A-S-T, that is a position. When a cow falls into a, maybe to a ditch and he falls on his back and his legs are up this way, 
he is in a cast position. If he doesn't get out of that position, he'll die. That's why you, you find these little roly-poly bugs, and if they get on their back, you don't have to kill them because they're going to die because they're in that cast position. And there's a lot of people in the body of Christ. You let the devil put you on your back. He's got you in a cast position. And all of a sudden you want to give up. When the Ephesians tell us to learn how to stand. Stand. Let's look at it. We'll see what else with this is. Oh, number three, verse five and seven. It says mortify. Interesting. That word, that word mortify is where we get the word mortician. Matter of fact, matter, matter of fact, that mortify, that's where we get our word mortgage. Yeah, I tell, I, I'll be honest with you. You know, we, 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 quote, we, you know we, we say we own our house. We don't own our house. The bank owns our house. <laughs> yeah, some, some of you are fortunate if you don't have that, but. But 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 we unfortunately we 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 have a mortgage, so they expect me to pay on this until I die. I don't expect that. I'll tell you what I. I'm believing that God is going to let me do what I do, and God's going to ble bless us completely. You know, you know. I, I pray to God we have no debt. Other, other than the other than the stupid mortgage. Okay. Here's what it says. Mortify, kill your sinful nature. That attitude, whatever that is, you need to be very honest with yourself and say to yourself, this is not a Christ-like attitude and I must kill my old nature. Because that old nature can't fit into this new spiritual suit. Number four, we find this in verse eight and nine. It says, put off the old man. Paraphrase, shed the skin of the serpent. Chap chapter three, verse eight and nine. Shed the skin of the serpent. We need, we, 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 need to, we need to realize, you know, that, that doesn't look like Jesus. That doesn't look like the Lamb of God. That looks like the serpent. Yeah, and and you, don't need anyone, you don't need anyone to point that out to you. You need to point that out to yourself. Father God, I, did, I, I need a checkup from the neck up. I need, I need to check on that. I, I, I need to have right thinking. I need to guard the words that come out of my mouth. I, I need to uh, 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 have my ears protected from people that are bringing this. D don't do it. I remember when, when I was an associate pastor back in, in, in 1975, 76, you know, and I was so committed to my pastor. And not the fact that he always did everything right, but I was committed to him. And people want to pull me aside and tell me what they didn't like about them. I don't know how many times I've said this to people. Okay, I'm, I'm be, before you keep talking, let me know. I'm going to tell you this. Everything you tell me, I'm going to go to the pastor and tell them. Well, why would you want to do that? Because you're not willing to say it in front of his face, then you shouldn't be telling me. Then the word got out, don't tell Pastor Gabe anything because he's a snitch. I'm not a snitch, I am a protector. Matter of fact, I look around this room, I promise you, there are, you, there are people in this room that people have come to me and said, I want to tell, I want to, I'm just going to use you, Sally. Yeah, I want, I, want, I, want, I want to tell you about Sally, and I know it wasn't a good thing. Stop. If you tell me anything else, my next call is to Sally. And it, and it stops. I don't, know what they, I don't know what they tell everyone else, but they don't tell me because I've made my mind. I am not going to let people dump their garbage on my lawn. I hope I'm helping you this morning, okay, because I'm, I'm being raw. I'm being rich. I'm, I'm trying to help you. He, so he says, put off the old man. It's time to take off the old clothes. You're, 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 uh, you're, you're in Colossae. You're in a coastal city. Take off the old clothes. But you don't leave naked. The very next thing in verse 10 and 12, it says that you put on 
the new man. Robe yourself in the righteousness of God. I'm shedding the skin of the serpent, but I am going to put on the righteousness of God. Amen. When God created Adam and Eve in the garden, God clothed him them in his righteousness. So therefore, they were, all, they were always clothed. But the serpent came up and what? And told to convince them that they were naked. What did God say? Who you been talking to? You've been talking to someone that's telling you any, something differently than I've been telling you. I'm going to tell you, everybody, look here. You, I want you to get this. We better obey, obey the voice of God. Amen. Because if not, you're going to start crimping the hose. Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need all that. I'm just going to let a little bit. Don't do that. Verse number 6. It's in verse 11. I mean, verse 13. Forbear with all men. Some people you just got to put up with. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Some people, some people you just got to put up with. Over the years, I've had thousands of people that I just had to put up with. I didn't agree with them, and I, and I, I, I didn't get entangled in what they were going on. I just had to put up with them, and that was it. And but the Bible says, forbear with, forbear with all men. In other words, quit playing judge. Quit playing judge. Right here in this room, and those that are working with social media, you know, I have no idea the journey that you took to get to your walk here this morning. So if I make any judgment calls, I'm passing judgment on what I see, but I'm not passing judgment on what is truth. So what do I do? I offer people grace. Write this down. I, this, this will help you. If you're going to make a mistake, let it be on the side of mercy. Yeah. If you're going to make a mistake, which we all will, let it be on the side of mercy. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Number seven, verse 13. Forgive all men. Talking to people all the time. Well, I don't need to forgive them because they haven't asked for forgiveness. Tell you something. It doesn't matter what they've asked for forgiveness. I tell you. <laughs> he forgave before you ever asked for forgiveness. He knows everything about you. And he still likes you. That's grace. Yeah. That's grace. Forgive all men. I choose. I choose to forgive. You guys have heard me say this so many times. And this, this, this has been an earmark verse for me for years, 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 years. Psalms 119 verse 165. Happy are they that love the law of God, and nothing shall cause them to be offended. Is it 165. It's not that those things didn't happen. Those things still come. But now I got a choice. What am I going to do with it? Am I going to live my life in offense and, and, and keep just crimping the hole, stopping the flow of God? Or am I going to say, hey, Lord, I don't get it, but guess what, Lord? I choose to forgive him or her, and I want the, I, I want the channels of the flow of God to be, up, to be uh, open in my life. Amen. Number eight comes in verse 14. Put on divine love. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. Put on divine love. I don't love just because I want to. I love because I've been, I've, I've been commanded by God to love. 
God baptized me in the spirit of love. Amen. Let me really understand agape. Let me really understand Christian love. See, in America, we, the words we use, it's English language is just so messed up because we use one word for everything. Yeah. I love my wife, but I love my swimming pool. Oh, I love my dog. I love the church. We just, we, we just use one word, and they're, all, and they're all different. One of my best friends, you're probably watching this uh, here, and he's from uh, Chick Sickles. He's from Philadelphia. Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. But God has called us. Tell you something. Everybody look at me. You don't have to like me. But you got to love me. Yeah. There's a whole lot of people that I love, and, I, and some of those same people I don't like too much. But because I love them, everybody look at it, because I love them anyway, I pray for them differently. Put on the divine, put on divine love. Number nine, verse 15. Let, that word let means you have the ability to allow it. Let peace rule in your, rule in your life. I just want peace. There's a whole lot of people, unfortunately, they love God, but they just love drama. Yeah. They, they've, always gotta, they've, always, they've always gotta find some drama. I, I put this on Facebook the other day, and here, here's, I said, hurting people hurt people. Abandon people, abandon people. Loving people, love people. Graceful people show grace. Merciful people show mercy. I don't know if I want to do that. That has nothing to do with what you want. Let's go. Let's tell you what. I'm going to go back to the, I'm going to still give but let's. But let's go back to the very first verse. Uh, if ye then, if you uh, then being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Uh, am I living a life where my life is risen with Christ? Pastor, this stuff isn't easy. No, this, this is some of the hardest stuff in the world. Because your, 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 flesh won't, your flesh won't get it. Okay. So let peace. Let Jehovah Shalom rule your life. Number 16. I mean, uh, number 10, verse 16. I'm going to show you how you do this. <laughs> you you want to stay in the pocket? Stay in the word. The, tell you what, the only place that ball is being hiked is right here. That's why the quarterback is standing right behind, standing right behind the um, the center, because he knows. I tell you what, for that for that guy to be running over there, he had to hike the ball over there. No, this is where it's going, and you got to stay focused here. That's the problem. People love God. They, 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 they're in church, but they're not. They're, but not. They're not focused. You know why the coach went to the bank to get his quarterback? <laughs> um, stay in the word. Stay in the word. I want you to get this. Stay in the word. I'm talking to so many people lately, and I'm, I, 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 God, I think I'm surrounded by so, so many hungry people. I'm getting texts constantly from two or three of them that said, you know, I, I just finished this passage. I finished this book, and man, it, it is just so exciting. Someone said, you know, I, I don't know why I never got this. It's just so exciting. Yeah. There's something supernatural about the word. I, um, uh. Reverend Oak, she's been doing a tremendous job on Wednesday night. Thank you. You've been doing a tremendous job. Yeah, come on. It's, 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 it's been good. Matter of fact, someone told me last week, I didn't told you that. Someone said, Pastor, you better watch out for your job. 
Oh, it don't bother me none. I tell you what, I'm, I, I'm of the opinion, you know, I don't want my kids to walk in my, uh, walk in my shoes. I want them to stand on my shoulders. Amen. I want to raise up men and women uh, of God that have such an anointing that I can just release all that to them. I'd love to be a place where, I'd, as much as I like preaching, I'd rather not preach on Wednesday nights. I'd like to be in word and be in prayer and do some other things. But anyway, you, she's doing, she doing a, a tremendous job. And I said, and, I, and I've told people two weeks ago, I said, I want you to go and I want you to read, very slowly, methodically, I want you to read the book of Galatians. Many of you have come to me and said, Pastor, I've been reading Galatians all week. One brother called to, uh, said, said I've, I've, I've read, I read Galatians and I don't know how many different translations he read it in because he really wanted to uh, come here on Wednesday nights and get it. Yeah. Stay in the Word. Tell you, if you stay in the Word, you won't get mad at me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I did not, this stuff works. Number 11, verse 17. It says, teach, admonish, and build up one another. That, that's my job, to build up, to teach, to admonish one another. As a shepherd, I don't want to make you bitter. I want to make you better. I, want you to, I really want you to serve. I really want you to serve God. heart it's my passion man teach admonish edify build up it's what the word of God calls us to do matter of fact there's another verse that, that we need to build up ourselves in the holy faith. When David got back to Ziklag, and all his friends turned against him. It's amazing. They had just, got a, they had just done a victory in the, in the city of Ai, and I'm sure they were patting him on the back. Man, what a great general we got here. And they got back to Ziklag, and while they were fighting this battle over here, the, the enemies came in and, and took the women and children and everything else. Now the very people who were patting him on the back is the one that stabbed him in his back. And he pulled himself off away, and he inquired of the Lord. Bible says, and then David encouraged himself in the Lord. I'm telling you, this is, ask, ask my wife, I have to do this sometimes. Yeah, I said, it's amazing. I, I can get 10 compliments in one day, and man, that's awesome. But I get one negative comment, I mean, it like pokes a hole in the balloon. And what do I do? Rather than focus on all the good, all the good, you know, how, how you've changed my life and the word of God working. Now I'm caught up over here. It's because I left this place. Even the good, even the good accolades that have come, that's fine. But I can't leave this place. I don't get caught up with this. I need to stay here because guess what? Because this is going to come. But if I stay here, I encourage myself in the Lord. I tell you what. I do it. I, I, I know you're going to laugh at me, but I love the mirror. <laughs> I'll explain it to you. Not because I look so good, but I prophesy. Everybody look at me. I prophesy to myself. Amen. I get in that mirror and I tell that guy right there, boy, you're going to make it. You might be as ugly as sin, but you're going to make it. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're a child of the Most High God. No matter what other, other preachers do, you, you are operating in the call of God. I, I do this. I step from the mirror and I prophesy to myself. Why? Because somebody ain't prophesying to me. I need to prophesy to myself. Amen. Glory to God. I, I tell you what, I'm not telling you to do that. For me, it works. For me, it works. Well, uh, brother, that's an amen right there. We're two or three together. We agree together. We're good. <laughs> Last one, number 12. 
Verse 17. Do everything that you do in a right spirit. Do everything as you do in a right spirit. If the one thing that I saw Thursday through the weekend with Yvonne and all those that helped, they were doing it with the right spirit. Man, I tell you, I, I went in the house and I told Dorothy, I said, I feel so guilty because it's, I know it's the Lord's yard, but this is my yard. You know, I had mowed the grass and, and done the weedier it could, and I stood back and, man, this, this looks really good. Until those ladies left. But they did it with the right spirit. They did it with the right spirit. Amen. If everybody just, someone needs to get this. Because really what I'm telling you right now, this here will cure some physical pains in your own body. Arthritis comes normally out of a bad spirit. It's the hardening of the bones. Because we got a bad spirit, we become, everybody say, uptight. That's what that is. When we are stressed out, we become uptight. And the reason that word is because when, when, when we're stressed out, all of us, there's tension in our shoulders. Sometimes it's kind of hard to breathe, and there's an attack on our heart, you know, and, and that's why we get a stiff neck. Hello? Yeah. And we, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden we get these headaches, and, and the vision is going. It's because we're so uptight. Listen, those that stay in the pocket with God, those that stay right here, those that quit crimping the hose, you won't live a life where you're always uptight. Glory to God. Pastor Gabe, that's some pretty good preaching. Well, I, I, I encourage you. You're doing pretty good. Well, thank you. God wants you blessed. Really, some, of, some of you, you just need to learn how to relax. You know, I, at 30 years old, I had two strokes. Matter of fact, one, Sunday, uh, one, one evening, my wife and I went to, people go to our church. They invited us over for dinner. It was a wonderful dinner. And we were just sitting there talking around the table. And all of a sudden, I realized that it felt like my whole left arm went numb. And when I was, I, the way I was sitting, my left leg went numb. And I figured it was, I, was, I was sitting on a nerve or something. So I kind of readjusted myself. So I said, excuse me. And I went to the bathroom. And I, I remember this. I stood in front of their, their well, wall in the mirror. I'm tapping my arm. What is going on? There's something wrong here. You know, and I was good. I went back and sat down. And the lady in the house said, I said, Pastor, you're not feeling good, are you? I didn't know this. I said, I'm, f I'm feeling fine. <laughs> and they rushed me to the hospital. And as soon as I got there, they, they did a, uh, a brain scan. They didn't find anything. Um, <laughs> let me rephrase that. Uh, no, norm, normally when you have a stroke, a part of your brain dies. They didn't find any, any death thing in my brain. And the doctor, I, I really, like, I wish I could remember what he called it, but he gave it a, a medical term that I had a stress stroke. At the time, I was a pastor. I was on the school board. I was a chaplain for the sheriff department. I was a chaplain for the fire department. I was a husband. I was a father. I sold men's clothes at a at Kaufman's um, men's clothing store. I had all these hats I was putting on. And the doctor said to me, he said, Pastor, when's the last time you had a vacation? Or no, when's the last time you had a day off? Well, I'm, I was one of these hyper-spiritual people back then. I was, bless God, I, I don't have a day off. I work 24-7 for the kingdom of God. <gasps> This non-Christian doctor said to me, oh, it's too bad you think you're better than God. Because even God took one day off. 
the lights came on. I was too uptight. And because I was so uptight, the things I was doing, I wasn't doing in the right spirit. So I literally went and sat. I slept. I laid on my couch for two weeks. As a matter of fact, my, my mother c uh, came to visit us at the time, and Dorothy was there. And for two weeks, I got them to take a bath, but I had pajamas on every day. Because if I put street clothes on, I'm gone. And the first time in my life I understood when David wrote in Psalms 23, and he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It was then and even especially now. I don't want to crimp the floor of God. I want to read the word. I want to pray. I want to hear the voice of God. That's what I want for you. I don't want anything else from you. I just want you to become strong, solid men and women of God that are, are not, uh, not, not easily offended. Yeah. And let's get on with the Father's business. Whew. Was that all right? Come on, give God. That's for the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, stand to your feet. I look around this room here, and I know that everyone, I, everyone that's here, I know you've given your life to Jesus, so we don't need to have an quote, an altar call. But let's, let this be a new, a new day, a new way for you. As we close up this meeting and worship, I want you to leave here on a high note. Glory to God. I'm asking you right now, take your new man by the nape of the neck. Command your new man to respond to the word of God. All that's within you, bless his holy name. Hallelujah.